you're listening to this right now, there is untold growth for your business, your personal brand, your reach on the other side of you giving up the fear of other people's opinions, the need to be liked, the need to please everyone, and the need to avoid offending anyone. You never could anyways, but you got to crank up that tolerance for that. And there's a lot of growth on the other side when you start putting out powerful messaging that you believe in on YouTube and social media. Hey everybody, what's up? I'm back here with Sean Cannell, Rhymes with YouTube channel. And if you've listened to the previous podcast where Sean was a guest, we're talking a lot about live production, the big gamble, scared money, don't make money. Uh, we're back because Sean's got a second edition, an updated edition of his book, YouTube Secrets. I'll provide links and notes uh, in in the show notes. The approach today is to really have a kind of a masterclass for uh, entrepreneurs who have either dabbled with YouTube or thinking about getting into YouTube or thinking, is this a good strategy for me? Is this a, a platform I want to invest money and time and energy? I can't think of a better person to share insights on this because I think, Sean, your primary thing is YouTube, right? Like you love YouTube, you talk about YouTube, you teach people how to grow on YouTube. So why don't we take it from there? And in case you missed the first episode, Sean, can you introduce yourself and tell a little bit of your backstory? Yeah, Chris, thanks so much for having me back. Um, I Today, Think Media is the company I run. We have 20 W-2 employees and 10 contractors, and we're on a mission to help people figure out how to create video. So we do a lot of camera, tech, live streaming, build your equipment set up to create content and then the strategy side and our focus is YouTube because I believe that YouTube is the most highly leveraged platform and we can get into that but with all of where we are today I'm I'm as shocked as everybody else because I'm a small small town kid college dropout and kind of an accidental entrepreneur and really a story of YouTube itself and its transformational power. I got into video in 2003, volunteering for my local church. The first YouTube channel that I started was for this church, an hour north of Seattle, small town. 2007, we started a YouTube channel for the church and a vlog for the pastor, which is way ahead of time. I mean, this was two years after YouTube started, 15 minute upload limits, no custom thumbnails, totally different platform, the techno technological infrastructure of it. So I've been in video, social, in YouTube for a long time. Eventually started a freelance video business in 2009, and then eventually started Think Media and discovered the power of affiliate marketing, creating content, and ranking videos. And the reason I fell in love with YouTube is YouTube is the only platform where your content lives forever. It's the only platform where if you create the right kind of content in the right way, you could post a video today that'll still get views weeks, months, or even 10 years later. I just looked up one of my videos that is over 10 years old. It grew my channel by like 16 subscribers, made $35 in YouTube ad revenue, and was actually talking about a lens attachment for a really old camcorder. And people are still watching that video and clicking the affiliate link. So I truly have a passive income generating asset that is over a decade old that I'm doing nothing with. I'm not promoting it. I'm not talking about it just the power of the YouTube algorithm. And here's what makes YouTube unique. All of the other social media platforms are content feeds. They call it an Instagram feed, a Facebook feed, a Twitter feed. YouTube is a content library. Behind you, if you're watching on video, is a library of books. And if you had a particular problem or pain point, you could walk over to your bookshelf and you'd say, I want to learn about teamwork. I want to learn about leadership. I want to pull a book off the shelf about mindset. I'm going to pull off a book of the shelf about YouTube. I'm going to pull a book off the shelf of design, maybe design inspiration or branding. YouTube's the same way. When someone has a particular question, a particular problem, or even just intent, they don't actually search a phrase. They just express their intent by their behavior. YouTube's algorithm starts to recommend content to try to meet that person's needs. So every business owner, entrepreneur, creative, freelancer should be creating strategic content that either attracts the ideal client or customer they want, or that leads to serving and solving a problem. And then you're able to monetize that attention in a lot of different ways. That was fantastic. I think the industry term is it's long tail content versus short tail we talk about the lifespan of a piece of content. And the reason why I think people get anxious about creating content is because if your content doesn't hit within the first three hours, 24 hours, it kind of disappears in the feed because YouTube, right, is powered by YouTube search engine. 
you're right. It's like just this kind of idea of just in time learning. The habits and behavior of people are much different on YouTube. And therefore, I think, and I want to get your perspective on this. Is it a social media platform? It is the forgotten social media platform. I think one, it's never listed. Um, people typically typically don't put it in the list of social media platforms. I think two, because it's not quite as interactive as other platforms. There's no DMs, although they're thinking about adding those back. At one time, there was. Um, and there is comments and debates and conversations happening in the comments, but it's different than other places. And because you're not posting photos the same way as you would on Facebook, although you have a community tab, which very much is like a Facebook feed and photos or polls or words in a way to talk to your audience. And YouTube is, uh, for better or worse, I believe it's better. And almost every platform is doing this, but it's a challenge no matter what is they are trying to be everything, whether it's YouTube shorts, there is a stories feature, YouTube stories, there is the community tab, which is text photos and a feed. There is, of course, your main videos, there's live streams, there's long form. So it could be kind of overwhelming. The end podcasting is one of the things I'm actually super excited about youtube.com forward slash podcasts. They hired a, uh, a leaked document from Alphabet, the parrot company of Google and YouTube revealed that they hired a podcast executive there. They acquired 20 NPR shows. They invested 500,000 into other creators that were only doing audio to get them doing video podcasts. And the stats actually reveal that at this moment, YouTube is the number one podcast destination for listening consumption to podcast. That surprises people because how could it be bigger than Apple or Spotify? But I think it's because of the factor of times YouTube is bigger in general. And so if you're listening to your podcast, you're listening to Lewis Howes, Impulsive, Logan Paul, H3H3, especially some of these famous YouTubers, YouTube is much larger already in terms of a podcast destination. And they're thinking about ingesting RSS feeds. So I, I would dare to say, to put it bluntly, that it is irresponsible for any serious business owner, entrepreneur, creative to ignore YouTube. I mean, if you care about your message and you want to reach people and you want to go, if you're comfortable where you are today, then by all means, don't invest in YouTube. But if you want to not just maximize your impact today, but also position yourself, be recession proof for the future, protect your brand, I think that your YouTube presence is an essential. Sean, not mincing words here. It's irresponsible of you as a business owner to ignore YouTube. Before we get into some more of this stuff, I do want to say there's one thing that makes me consider YouTube not a social media platform. And the biggest one is shareability. Like if I love a video, I don't go on YouTube to share it with other people who are on YouTube. It just doesn't seem to work like that. Or maybe I don't know, Sean. I take the video and I go and share it on Twitter somewhere else where it that kind of active sharing happens. And so I put YouTube in a very special place. Now, both you and I, I think, and I'm speaking for, for you and tell me if I'm wrong, I have a special connection to YouTube because I didn't do social media before I actually learned how to create content on YouTube. And YouTube is what I would always consider for the foreseeable future, our home base of operations. I've since ventured forth as you have as well, but I consider a very special place. Now, Somebody might be listening to this and think, well, why is it so special? For me, it's special because YouTube's one of those uh, rare companies that takes an interest in helping you as a creator make a living doing this thing. With monetization, they produce events, and they used to, pre-pandemic, have creator spaces where you can come and shoot. They have advisors or managers who help you, and they're constantly talking to you with you to help you figure out a way to make money. They had the merching, merchandising thing. They had a subscription to channel. Now they're adding lots of ways to put real money into your pocket, not to mention the affiliate deals and the sponsorships that you can establish outside of YouTube. I've checked my earnings on Instagram. I'm not sure it's enough to buy like a, a meal yet. I'm not sure. But on YouTube, it's revenue or expense neutral for us, meaning we generate more revenue passively just from AdSense than it costs us to produce the content which is like a crazy model if you think about it. Many of you will run a campaign to onboard new customers and you'll spend money, it's called cost per acquisition and you're looking at ROAS, return on ad spend. What if you can make content that people consume that is like uh, marketing material for you, but they pay you to consume it? This is a phenomenal idea. And we, you and I were there with Hermosi at uh, your, your conference. He's like, you know what? I used to spend all this kind of money doing ad spend and now I put it into content. And I'm getting a 10x return. So you're probably right. It's probably irresponsible. 
100%. And we experienced the same thing. Uh, Erica Kohlberg um, has kind of known, probably most people here have seen her and you might see she uh, is the same person in like a TikTok as the customer that says, I want to return these Nikes. And then they go, uh, you know, it's past their pull date. She goes, no, actually, it says I can if there's a tear in them. And they go, ah, who told you this? And she's like, I'm Erica, the social media lawyer. So she revealed her her numbers. And this is true. As you mentioned, your Instagram uh, can't probably buy a meal. Mine is similar. And I think she said she hadn't qualified for some reason for Instagram. So that was zero. TikTok was a couple thousand, like three. Uh, Facebook was a few hundred. And YouTube was 36,000 in this particular case study. And uh, I know she's earned more than that, but those are the kinds of factors of dollars in the YouTube world. And what's fascinating is, you know, YouTube Shorts is about to unleash a whole nother level of monetization, which is going to be disrupting in the market. YouTube is already attracting a lot of um, people from other platforms, maybe build a brand somewhere, but they want to move to YouTube because that's like where the big kids live. It's like where the serious brands are established. And so they leverage their authority somewhere else, but they want to be on YouTube and it also pays the best. And so February, 2023, when that rolls out, it's like, um, going to pay even more for those doing YouTube shorts. I know you do a lot of YouTube shorts and the CMO of HubSpot said that YouTube subscribers are the most valuable subscribers on the internet. So to your point of Alex Ramosi mentioning that you literally get paid to essentially grow your brand and get a positive revenue. And it's so it's a win, 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 win when you're really doing YouTube right. And so I agree, uh, YouTube is a very unique place. And of course, in this conversation, that's not to say it's not easy. It's easy. It's not to say that what you've built or what I've built has happened overnight or um, is something that isn't going to take work, hustle and resources or and all of the above. But I think it's about, as business leaders, we're always kind of strategically deciding where to invest our time and money. And so I want to invest in a good investment. I want to invest in something that even if there's a heavy upfront investment in my mindset, my labor, maybe getting uh, hiring, delegating, learning the skill sets, getting it set up. It's just saying, is that all going to be worth it? And YouTube is good ground to plant on. And it's also not like it's about to stop. It is the number one video platform. It has absolute market dominance. No matter what numbers TikTok claims, there's a few more minutes of watch time among Gen Z and a day-by-day basis. It doesn't even speak to the depth. Again, the CMO of HubSpot, YouTube subscribers are the most valuable subscribers. We see the numbers too. Our TikTok is blowing up. I am, I am passionate about other platforms. We started really late and we're almost to a quarter million followers, 5 million likes. This thing is, but Dang. even when I measure, LinkedIn bio clicks. Like even I just depth of people wanting to go deeper, it doesn't even come close to Instagram, which has smaller numbers, right? but it doesn't even come close to YouTube in terms of revenue generated, but also actions taken, meaning clicking a link in the description or clicking the link in a pinned comment or fo- following a verbal call to action. YouTube is where people go to be, they, they want to seriously learn. It's where professionals go. It's where people that are in a more of an action they have their credit card out to make a purchase. They are in an action learning mindset. And so respect to TikTok, but you're you're in a more passive consumption entertainment mode. Of course, you could do education there. Of course, it can lead to business opportunity, but the, it has nowhere near the depth. And so these are some important facts about YouTube. So you can make an educated decision about how you're going to invest your time, your money, your human resources, your financial resources. Okay. So much for us to follow up on. The one thing I wanted to point out that you mentioned earlier about podcasts is I believe uh, Joe Rogan is the number one listened to podcast in the world, maybe. Yes. And I got to tell you, I've never listened to his podcast, but I watch him on YouTube all the time. It didn't occur to me that that stat would then line up. And I think you're right. And I think for some people who might be like, oh, you, well, I'm experiencing the same thing. We've recently found success by video podcasting now. Like this is a podcast. You're going to listen to this. And some of you will actually see this on YouTube. And there's a visual so you can see Sean's face and you can see his passion and his uh his steel blue eyes and just looking right at you, piercing through the screen. You might be able to see that. And we're seeing that people like long form content, especially the data that we've seen on our channel, not just shorts. Now you talked about a couple of things about the mindset of people who are consuming content. And I think you're right. 
and I, I'm, I'm just looking at myself too. I'm holding up a mirror here. On other social platforms, it's really passive. I want to be entertained. I have short pockets of time. I'm not really in this active learning space. I'm just leaning back. Whereas on YouTube, I'm not on YouTube unless I'm looking for something. I'm looking for help. I'm looking for some topical story about what's going on in the world. And this is where I'm going to get my news and entertainment from. So it's an active lean in mindset. I want to pull something out. And I think, and, and your, the, the data seems to back it up. The audience that's on YouTube is the most valuable in the world of all the different platforms because of the behavior and the mindset. Okay. If you're sitting there driving, listening to this, where, wherever you are, and you're like, you know what? You're right. You're right. I need to get on this. Okay. There's some challenges. Obviously, some, some, some big barriers to entry, Sean, and help us get us through this. Recording, editing, producing, publishing a video requires the most amount of effort. The least would be a tweet at the opposite end of the spectrum on the creator side, right? What can you tell us about that barrier of barrier to entry that can help someone put this into action? Yeah, I think that also is one of the reasons why there is opportunity because it is arguably the most challenging platform. Um, all of the skill sets come together. It's not just a still image on Instagram. You need to make a still image for your thumbnail. It's not just good copy. You need to write good copy for your title. You don't just need to be on 15 seconds like a story on Instagram, but you need to probably thoughtfully put together a video that is three, four, five, six, seven, eight minutes long. And there is no ideal video length in today's world. It's just as long as it needs to be, but as as short as possible, delivering value. And then production. I think that still... um, what can happen is because of all those moving parts, I've heard in sales a phrase that says a confused mind never buys. And I also think the confused entrepreneur doesn't take action. As soon as you start thinking about your YouTube strategy, you go, okay, I listen to Chris, I listen to Sean, but, and okay, I do have a camera, but I don't know how to use it. Or I do have, then then you kind of just stop. And I think a lot of people get stuck in that journey. So we encourage people, you got to just punch fear in the face, punch perfectionism in the face and press record. I think the simplest thing to, to do is to realize that your smartphone, you could just f- flip it to landscape. It doesn't have to be portrait like the other platforms. You can plug in a good microphone, audio matters. What we teach is AVLS, audio, video, lighting, stabilization. Audio, you could get a simple mic off of Amazon. There's some really cool ones for iPhone or USB-C that plug right into the port and then hook to your shirt that are wireless for as cheap as $25 or less. Um, That's kind of the third-party brands. You could pay a lot more for slapping a logo on there, but you don't need to. You can sit in front of a window or connect a a simple, there's $50 light light soft boxes. And then stabilization would be a tripod to just be able to get your smartphone mount, sit on a stool, get the the camera angled properly. And then you could just hit record. And additionally, if you just shot on your phone, you could walk behind the camera, press record, sit down, start talking, and just move the front and the back in of the video. No editing, meaning you just kind of trim starting it a little bit and then upload that right from your phone. And for most people, the best place to start would be to answer specific questions. We call it the ASQ method. As a professional, you're already doing this. There's already the top 10 to 20 questions you get and you could turn one question into one video. And think about it, it, you know, what do I say? What if I get nervous? Think about it like having a conversation at coffee with a friend. You're going to sit down across from them at the table, grab your coffee or your tea, and you're just going to deliver value. And they might, if you were in real estate, they just say, yeah, but I'm just kind of overwhelmed. How do I know how much house I can afford? And you go, oh, here's how you calculate it. How much you made it. And you could probably, any anybody listening to this, in your area, these basic answers. And that's a key. I would encourage individuals to not think that you have to get super advanced, to not assume that because maybe this question's already been answered or there's already competition. No, the place to start is with beginner and basic answers. And the curse of knowledge keeps most people from even going here because they assume it's too obvious. They assume everybody knows this. No, there's always new people and there's always people that are looking for clear answers to specific questions. Even better would be what is the housing market update in King County or Snohomish County? We just got an Airbnb going in Snohomish County. And 
you'd be shocked in a 2023 world, you'd think, ah, it's probably already saturated with agents and loan officers sharing market updates and real estate information and in a place as busy as Snohomish County, which is north of Seattle. And there's like one person who's consistent and he's not even that consistent. His name's Zach McDonald. We went to high school together. And so I'm like, are you kidding me that in a 2023 world, all he does is sit down in front of a phone at his real estate office, got a journal out. It's okay to read off it. One of my favorite channels is called, I think, Clear Tax Value or Clear Value Tax, something like that. He stands in front of a wall with good lighting, good audio, a clipboard, and delivers information basically real time in about seven to eight minutes. And he's pulling 200, 280,000, 400,000 views of video. And it's because the information's good. People are not worried about the production value. I would argue his presentation is not that charismatic. I love him because he's clear, he's brief, he's concise, he delivers the point. And so for the if you're listening to this, I think that's the opportunity to just start, to start simple with the phone you already have, to start before you get $75 of accessories from Amazon and our YouTube channel, Think Media, could point you to those or you could just see- seek them out. Um, and all of a sudden, you're, you're, you can hang with anybody in terms of your production quality, but that is not what people are asking about. And I would go so far. We have so many students that have already proved this point. They have done everything wrong. They frame the video wrong. Their energy is wrong. There's nothing fancy about how they delivered whatever. But, but let me put wrong in air quotes. It's not wrong because I'm thinking about Andrew, who's a, a real estate agent in Vegas, this first video he posted on a terrible webcam framed up wrong with horrible echoey audio in his office has 305,000 views because he just talked about mistakes buyers make when talking to an agent and buying a house and delivered value. So if you understand that it's the content value, not the production value, and certainly over time, you can enhance everything. In fact, that's key. Like anything, we should be getting 1% better with every upload, always working on our craft. You're one of the biggest proponents of this about mastery skill development, about owning your craft and really being an artist and delivering all of that. But that's overwhelming at the start. That's part of the journey. And you can watch it all evolve over time, but don't overestimate the barrier to entry. Keep it simple. Figure out how you're going to create the video with your phone. Answer some specific questions. Be brief, be bright, be fun, and be done in the content. And then upload that thing to YouTube and then just keep going. And of course, That's why channels like ours exist. Because yes, you might be like, what about these other million things? Hey, one thing at a time and one upload at a time. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, uh, and then pace yourself and you'll be shocked because your hesitation is why 99% of your competitors are not going to take action. So when you're the person that takes action, that becomes the opportunity. And again, I, this is kind of a, polarizing statement or just say for what it's worth, I believe that saturation is a myth. I think that I'm not ignorant or denying that there is competition competition, or that there's a lot of competition in some industries and some niches. But Steve Jobs said it like this. He said, business is a game of attrition. If you just keep standing, if you're just still there six years later, and that's what I've now had the privilege of being in this for so long that I'm like, man, those that are just consistent, they improve their content a little bit. Uh, with each upload, they keep adding value. You might not strike. Here's the key. You, this is not a get rich quick thing. You might not strike gold in year one, year two, or you year three, but you might on, on the flip side, you will have an empire on year seven, eight, and nine. If you just commit to your craft and what will happen is again, a lot of your competition will fall off. Um, because business is a game of attrition. Mm. Okay. Um, a couple things to follow up on here. If you're the person who's doing the content yourself, a lot of what you're saying applies. And I just want to let people know, because I I came back from Adobe Max earlier this year, and using Premiere, it auto-transcribes the words that you're speaking, and you can edit the video like you would a Word document, and it puts the cuts in for you. So tools are coming out, if they're not already available, that are going to make the whole process of creating a video even easier. So it comes back to the to the real problem, which is, what do you have to say? How do you create value for others? How do you serve other people? And the ones who can do that the best will win this game eventually. You just have to stick it out long enough so that the the algorithm can find you, that your community, your audience can, can discover you. 
And it might take a year. It might take more than that. It might take multiple years, but you need to do that. Now, I want to say this, and I think I mentioned this last time, but in case somebody's not watching, you know how I motivate my team? I tell them, Sean is at 2.2-ish million subscribers. We're at 2.02, so he's 200,000 ahead of us. And it's difficult to catch someone who's a prolific creator whose business is to help others grow their YouTube channel. But I said, catch Sean. Love him. He's a good guy, but catch him, please. Because it motivates us. Like, what do we have to do? How do we have to grow? How do we need to change and improve and connect and use all the tools that are available to us? Because it's like you've ran four laps ahead of us. And to catch you at this point, unless you fall asleep, it's not going to be easy. But that's what gets us up in the morning. I just want to put that out there. It's not a negative competitive thing. It's a positive competitive thing. We have to catch you somehow. And you got an amazing team. I saw them at work at your conference. Okay. Let's, let's rewind the tape here. I love the way that you phrase things. You have a cadence. You're almost like a freestyle sermon minister, just dropping, dropping bombs and things like that. How did you develop this skill set? And then I want to get into like, if we want to grow YouTube as a team, there's a whole team of us and we have money. We'll get into that in a little bit. So how did you develop this cadence, this flow that you have? How did I develop this skill? I think the first thing was the intentional decision that I wanted to grow as a communicator. Um, I think that I'm a big believer in having a PDP, a personal development plan, and a big believer of having being clear on what do you want to grow in, but also being clear on what you don't want to grow in. I'm not working on my golf game right now. I'm not working. I'm not trying to become a better basketball player. I've narrowed my focus and I've thought, okay, what do I want to be great at as it pertains to what I do? And uh, communication is not only one of the most high powered skills in general, but especially if you're going to be a content creator, that's the essence of what it is. And of course, communication could be verbal. It could be your cadence when speaking, but communication is everything down from the crafting of the video itself as it weaves into all the little parts. But in relation to essentially public speaking and on camera speaking, the first thing was a decision. The second thing was uh, getting resourced. I remember back might have been 2008 or nine, where I got on eBay and I brought, bought a 12 CD set on how to be a better communicator. And so, yes, CDs, not MP3s. And it was John Maxwell and Chris Widener for the discs were on just a bunch of vocabulary words. And, and they're actually teaching on teaching. I think what was also helpful is, you know, one of the sometimes the missing pieces, I believe that the e-learning industry is one of the biggest opportunities right now. People packaging what they know in an online course, it's going to be a billion dollar in indus- a day industry soon. And however, a lot of people are kind of just going, you know, half-heartedly or, or they're jumping into it. Do you know how to teach? Do you know how to structure your content? Have you ever studied teaching itself or adar- adult learning theory? So I've had the privilege of, I was a part of a small Bible college, and then I taught in that same school. So these early years forced me, and then I was also in school, I was learning how to prepare a sermon. Preparing a good sermon is actually like preparing a good YouTube video. You you want to have a hook, you want to get the listener engaged, you are you have a premise, you have a, a, a point you want to make, and then you're building around that point. You're there structure to it. Uh, and then going deeper, if you're actually taking someone through a curriculum. So all of that served me and it was not passive. Like, it's kind of like Malcolm Gladwell popularizes the 10,000 hour rule. People think it's 10,000 hours doing the thing or 10,000 hours of practice, which is an incomplete truth and not what he discovered. What he discovered was one distinct word. It's not 10,000 hours of practice. It's 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. And that changes everything. Being deliberate is the fact that you're there taking notes, observing the details. One of the the things that breaks my heart the most is I don't see people take notes anymore. Um, I'm a big faith guy, church guy. I don't see people take notes in church. I think it's their loss. However, I'll go to all kinds of conferences, you know, social media conferences, marketing conferences. I'm shocked. People aren't taking notes. And I'm like, man, you, you, you bought a ticket. You hope to learn what you're absorbing. And you also, I hope you, you want the end result. You want to learn what the session is teaching, retain it, apply it so that your business grows. 
so that ultimately the money hits your bank account for you and your family. And so you can make a bigger difference in the world. What else are you going to do right now? Why, why, why are you, A, why are you scrolling on Instagram? But B, even if you're paying attention, why aren't you not taking notes? All the data would reveal that even if you never refer to it again, it's going to be more sticky by writing it down. You're going to retain it better. But if you review it once, your retention goes up like 4X. And so I not only will take notes through basically everything. I take notes all the time. Um, this kind of a rabbit trail, but I think there's value here. Like I take, I took notes on our team's Enneagram presentations once because I want to, uh, our whole team at our all team went through Enneagram personality tests. And I was like, I want to know them better. And so I'm going to take notes this entire time as opposed to uh, just, you know, passively listening or getting distracted. And so the punchline is uh, not only was I always in a deliberate practice mindset, but no matter what session I was sitting in, it might not even have been the content I was interested in. I would take notes on the delivery. I would have those two parts of the observation. What can we learn here from the person that's speaking? What can I learn at this conference? What can I learn from studying great communicators on TED Talks? How can I reverse engineer? There's a good book called Decoding Greatness. Man, it's one of my favorite books. You'd love it if you haven't heard about it by Ron Friedman. And it's, it's actually about the skill of reverse engineering. And saying that all the greats look at the masters and model the masters and break down the pieces and reverse engineer talks about how Gates and it, it, how Steve Jobs was so mad at Bill Gates because he's like, you stole our software. And, uh, you know, I can't believe. And he goes, mm, Steve, actually, um, we both stole it from Xerox. Like they have had this, you know, and so to that end, it was it was somebody else inspired them. And so communication best practices are it's a lifelong journey, lifelong learning. And, and so being intentional and getting around great communicators and then deliberately learning and then asking questions when I had the opportunity to get feedback on my sessions, um, when I maybe speak on stage, Hey, what could I have done better? If I could get coached from somebody, if you can enroll in somebody's program to become a better speaker, I've done all of the above. And then I think the final thing that's also a missing piece for many, I heard one person say, and I, I don't know if I respect this, but but I, 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 maybe they're busy, whatever they go, you know what? I post stuff online and I never watch it back. And I'm like, wow, why are we bragging? I heard somebody else say, I don't take notes anymore. I just, I, I'm, they've really arrived at some kind of success. I'm like, why are we bragging? I take notes on sessions. I already know if I actually know it, I'm still writing it down because repetition is the father of learning and the mother of mastery. I'm trying to absorb this. I, repetition is the key to training. I want to repeat something so much, not just so that, uh, I remember, but so that I never forget. I want it like in my spirit so that I can be world class. The final thing though is is watching game ta tape. And you know, Kobe, may you rest in power, was famous for watching his game tape back, whether he won or lost, because he wanted to learn and be a, a master of what he was doing. So it's watching back your YouTube videos or a web class you do or anything that you've done. I just noticed on a recent podcast that I, every few words I said, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. And I'm telling you about that now. Cause I watched this this morning and I was like, I need to have a, a, a better go-to phrase or more variety in my reset phrase. I, I want to be thoughtful about not saying and so on and so forth 38 times in one podcast. Mind you, I just got out of a sauna with Andrew, Andre Jick, weirdest podcast I've ever been where I was with him and his co-host in a sauna at five levels of heat. So I might not have been in the greatest state of mind. Nevertheless, I'm like, I, you know, it's still a good podcast, not overly critical. I don't go, I don't catastrophize and spin out. I just go, okay, that's a good distinction. I, I should, I want to work on that by reviewing my game tape. So I hope those are helpful, taking notes, deliberate practice, reviewing your game tape, and then having kind of a grace-based productivity and a grace-based growth process that you're not comparing yourself to anyone. Of course, when you start communicating, you might be saying a lot of ums, you might not be super sharp, you might not be super polished. It's a big journey. It's been deliberate practice over decades now for me of being intentional with this. So just pacing yourself, having grace on the journey, but making a decision that growing as a communicator, forget YouTube, it's just one of the most important and powerful skills that you could ever grow in. If you grow as a communicator, your income will grow, your relationships will be stronger, you'll be able to enlist more people in your vision, you'll be able to communicate your ideas more powerfully, you will ultimately make a greater impact in the world. It goes back to one of those things that it's like, why would I hesitate to invest in something that powerful 
if there's anything I'm going to study and improve my game in, I definitely want to do that in communication. I'm going to ask you a question. And before I get you to answer, I want to remind our audience who we're talking to. We're talking to Sean Cannell. He co-wrote the book, YouTube Secrets. They're on their second edition. Uh, he co-wrote the book with Benji Travis, who I know and like as well. And we're talking all things YouTube today, strategies, high level concepts for you, the entrepreneur who wants to grow a channel, to develop your authority, create opportunities for yourself, maybe even to develop passive income. Who knows what your motivations are, but we're here to help you. I want to ask you this question because I get this question asked a lot. They'll say, Chris, you're a great communicator, you're a great public speaker. I like how you speak about things, your tone, your cadence and all that. And the question they ask is, is a strange question, but I get the spirit of it, which is, how do I become you? Now I'm going to ask you this question more specifically. You just gave us a bunch of notes, but I want to ask you kind of maybe a side question here, which is who do you model yourself after that's a little bit off and weird that people didn't know? And I'll, I'll answer that question as well, because how do you learn to speak and to present and get your flow from? Is there a person living dead, somebody you're watching, listening to that you're like, here's a person and I picked this up from them and I'm trying to do that myself. I'll try to go fast. I mean, there's so many. And in fact, in the back of YouTube secrets, uh, the acknowledgements is a very meaningful portion and it was updated for the second edition. Um, one of the biggest privileges I've had was also being a video editor. And one of the things I learned about Joel Osteen and who's probably the most maybe the influ most influential communicator broadcasted most widely globally uh, in terms of television and radio. He was a video editor for his dad. And his dad was the pastor of the church before him, and they started a TV show. So Joel would edit his dad's messages. Well, most preachers, they talk long, 45 minutes, 52 minutes, an hour and three minutes. Well, he had to edit his dad's sermons into 27 minutes for TV. So... Week after week, he was sitting down, listening to good communication, but learning how to be precise, learning how, learning distinctions and finding ways to maybe say more things in less time. There's another good book out right now called Smart Brevity that I'm reading about, I think, an important skill set for today's world. And he, as a result, took his communication to another level. So being a video editor myself and having freelance clients, one of the people I learned in particular humor timing from was a guy named Dr. Dave Martin. So I was doing freelance social media and video editing for him for a couple of years. I, I learned a lot of things. I learned that he also, he had mainly one message or two messages that he would share everywhere because he would speak new places, which popped the myth that I always had to be saying new things that it actually spoke to that if I could craft core messages and actually say a few things really well, that that's more poignant than trying to always come up with something new. Nobody could can, can effectively do that. It's very difficult to always have like a polished. And so I learned that I, he, he would include a lot of jokes in his material. So I would list literally second for second, cause I'm editing video. So I would learn timing cadence. That is one um, genre that is very worth studying. See, and many people already would probably watch Netflix specials of comedians. Comedians are, are the greatest communicators on the planet. They test jokes in different environments. They get the good ones. They learn the timing of them. You'll notice their vocal delivery, vocal change, the tone, whispering, speaking louder, and then even mannerisms that reinforce what it is that they're doing. If you start watching, I hope maybe after listening to this podcast, everyone's future is ruined because they can, it's like people who learn storytelling and can never watch a movie again because they understand like three act sequence and they're like, ah, I know what's going to happen because the antagonist and the pro, you maybe not be, won't be able to watch a comedian without deliberate practice now. Okay. I'm watching Kevin Hart. I'm watching Dave Chappelle through a new lens of how and when and pausing, leaving some margin in how they speak. And so, uh, Dr. Dave Martin's one. John Brevere would be another one in the church world. And and uh, people maybe have different background if they've been a part of any church where they'd say, I did not get exposed to like a world-class communicators in church, in my experience. I think maybe because of the uh, types of churches I was exposed to, communication beyond even just preaching or teaching was elevated to an extremely high level where I've had the opportunity to sit in rooms with 
some of the world's probably greatest communicators, especially in the church world. And whether that's a TD Jakes or a Joel Osteen or working for Benny Perez in Las Vegas, again, an incredible communicator and certain jokes or timing or even mannerisms certainly have influenced me. And then watching a lot of Gary V, there could be things that have come through or watching Casey Neistat where there'd probably be nothing visual or that I'd say, but just as you study storytelling or as you study editing or also as you practice a lot. So there's a ton of influences um, in my communication and those are a few. I promised I would share some of my own and it was kind of interesting how much of our life is different but overlap at the same time. Uh, I have to give my hats off, my hat off to to Joel Osteen because I watched him speak. My my wife's a born again Christian. She was watching for a period of time, so I kind of was able to peek over her shoulder and look. This this gentleman is very good at storytelling, pulling you in, making complex concepts very simple to understand and repeatable. And he's very charismatic in this way. He's a powerful speaker, but he also doesn't put himself on a pedestal. He brings himself down by referring to daddy always says, and he speaks like that, like you're a grown man with children yourself, but he refers to his dad this way. And so it makes you feel like I can relate. I can get on this train and ride this with him. Um, the other person that the, the types of people you mentioned are comedians. I watch comedians for, for different reasons, mostly for stage presence and storytelling. And so I remember this one where Kevin Hart goes out into a football size stadium. Maybe all of his concerts are like that, but he walks on with a swagger that I'd never seen before. And he's a small man and he knows his, his physical comedy and how he does things, right? He's swinging his arms around. And I think I need to steal that. And so I'm watching it, rewinding it, and I'm practicing the exact same walk. We talk about modeling, about editing and studying and reverse engineering greatness. My, walk, my wife walks in the room, like, what are you doing? This, this is a little strange, like you're caught doing something weird. And then I do the walk for her and she goes, that's really cute. You should do that. And getting that stamp of approval from my wife's like, okay, I might try this on stage next time. But uh, th- I want to just bring this right back to you, which is this. How would you describe your communication style? What makes you unique and different, Sean? I'm just curious about your self-awareness and how you perceive the way you come across to people. I don't know. I would actually be interested in in your response. Um, And I don't know how strong my self-awareness is, but a few things I try to do. um, I do try to depreciate, be self-depreciating. Um, and that's a powerful communication thing. Again, a lot of times people's defenses are up. So if you could be vulnerable or transparent, I think vulnerability and transparent, I like to be known for just real, real talk. Uh, perception, of course, might not be perceived that way, but for just being a, a complete open book on almost any podcast I'll go, they'll go, what's off limits here? What can't we go? I'm like, I don't know why anything would be off limits as far as I know. My phone's tapped right now. The internet facial recognition, I just uploaded my face to an AI generator, you know, on the trend. Privacy has got to be gone. So why wouldn't I tell you anything? I'm happy to share all my numbers because I share them with the government and I trust you way more than the government. Like they know my numbers. And so uh, I'd be happy to tell you mine. So just happens to, so kind of a vulnerability, raw, want to be known for, for truth. And, and then I think a huge word for me would be clarity. I don't want to waste people's time. So when I sit, in a communication situation, the way I get frustrated and I still, and I would say frustrated because I'm still learning. You can learn from the wins and the losses, the mistakes that you observe is we've all probably been there too. You're like, where's this going? This person lost me. Then I'm thinking, why'd they lose me? I'm, they're opening up. I'm not sure what we're talking about. How are they framing this? What's happening? So my pursuit is to be clear. And then I think probably the other big word for me would be teacher. So even on my YouTube videos, I have some live streams minute for minute, no editing, 45 minutes. One's on its way to 3 million views. I teach off of a slide deck. I just talk on a webcam, USB microphone, teach off a slide deck, which by the way, is a good crutch, is a helpful crutch. I got notes behind, not afraid to look down and read my notes so that I can read a pre-written poignant paragraph because I want to deliver clarity. I'm not mo- most frustrated or I'm not most worried about someone seeing, oh, he looked down and read his notes. I'm most worried about the information being clear and effective. And so it's it's really coming from a teacher hat, which 
as far as I, almost anybody, maybe my competitors or whatever, they'd be teachers as well. But I think I go back to that almost studying and wanting to have teaching best practices, very points driven. A lot of stuff I'll teach will at least have three, five points. So there's organization to it. And you could argue that it would probably be, um, in fact, on stage that uh, the preacher from my experience, especially in ministry, comes into um, how I would deliver business content as well. And some of the attributes of preachers that I love the most is, again, if it's clear, if it's engaging, if there is humor to reset attention. My years in youth ministry, I think, is helpful. Fast forward now to kind of TikTok. And I don't think it's an age thing. I think that adults appreciate it as well. But especially if you want to connect to the next generation, one of the things you learn is you can't drone on and be monotonous for very long without losing their intention. So it might be the consistent insert, the insertion of, of a joke, of a pop culture reference, of something. All of those little details have found their way into my communication style over the years. But I, I don't know if we have time. I'm curious, from your observational standpoint, I might not be able to see the forest from the trees if there's anything you think is distinct about my communication style. I think you're spot on. I would use different words and I'll, I'll, I wrote down my words, so I'll share them with you so that there's a reflection here for you. I, I would probably put you right, like one of the top attributes that come to my mind is high energy. I, mm. If I don't know and I don't know, I would guess you're an extrovert. I remember walking by the auditorium when you were speaking at uh, Grow With Video. I was like, oh my God, that's like coffee for your brain. It's like, woo, Sean is just on it right now. He's cranked it from four to like 12 and he's high energy. You are a very clear, intentional, deliberate speaker. You're very persuasive. I believe there's that same teacher DNA, whether it comes from uh, youth ministry or whatever. There is the the preacher vibe in you. Not to say that you're preachy, but people who know how to command the word and a phrase and, and control the energy in the room and moderate their own energy, you definitely have that. I'd also add the word stoic in there that... And, and you're very persistent. Like when you want to say something, you're going to say it and you're not super uh, concerned whether or not somebody's going to be like, wow, why is he saying that? You know what you want to do and you're there to deliver, deliver whatever it is your intention is. And it's okay that some people misread that. And that's, I think that's a good thing. You're, you're not so caught up in yourself that you're second guessing what it is that you're saying. I would consider your sense of humor. Like there's some dad jokes thrown in there. And I like it. And people like that. Some puns and pop culture references. I saw you sprinkle them in. You don't do it too heavy because you're not trying to like be a comedian on stage, but you do that because it brings some levity and it makes you way more relatable. So those were my words. I appreciate that. You know, and the funny thing about humor, I was re listening to a, a talk about this recently. That's a tough one. I don't know if I'm good at it because the problem is depending on the room depends on how good the, the humor hits or not. Because do, is the pop culture reference understood? I think the dad joke is funny, but historically dad jokes, your wife doesn't think it's funny. And when your kids are old enough, they don't think it's funny either. It's like the dad joke is for the dad and it's terrible. And so um, that has actually been a, a, a pitfall I've fallen into. And I appreciate you giving me some feedback and it was all kind. And so I, I'm always open to critical feedback. In fact, that's my preference because that's how you get better. Iron sharpens iron. I like that pain. Um, but humor is a tough one. And that's one I would want to improve on because I was listening to a talk that's saying, to your point, Kevin Hart, any comedian, they test in small clubs lots of jokes to narrow down one, oftentimes one set for an entire year that can impact a larger group of people. You're in trouble if some people get it and only a portion of the audience gets it. But probably one of the biggest mistakes you can make as a communicator is also alienating another part of your audience. So how do you maybe at times do that a few times, but not too much so that you don't push anybody away and you at least include as many people as possible, reaching people where they are. John Maxwell wrote a book called Everybody Communicates, But Not Everybody Connects. What is our goal here? He said the number one question for any communicator is first, none of the stuff we just talked about, it's who are you talking to your degree of understanding. We say the creator who understands the viewer best wins. So on YouTube, the creator who understands the viewer best wins when you have empathy and understanding and clarity of the problems and ambitions of the viewer you want to reach on the other side, that goes everything. 
Because who, what we could argue, this person's funny or this person's not funny. This person's a good communicator. This person's not. It's actually kind of subjective. It, it, it's the combination of them plus the audience. In fact, there's not everybody thinks Kevin Hart's funny or is a Kevin Hart fan. You're not everybody's cup of tea. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, you aren't. Not everybody loves the future. Like, it's fine. Like, so actually, it's kind of like finding your community, finding your voice, and also finding your people finding the way you communicate, being yourself, having that authenticity and, and improving and, uh, and then leaving at ha- being okay with the people who don't resonate with you, but going deep with the people who do and having as much empathy and understanding for your audience. I'll briefly share a story. I speak at social media marketing world every year, uh, mostly over the last few years, my friend, Michael Stelzner and, um, two years back, this might've been pre pre pandemic. So there was a couple years where it didn't happen. So this might've been 2019. I got my reports, but they do a great job of surveying the audience. And I bombed, terribly bombed. Filmer Sean reaches out to me. He's like, hey, we've known you to be really a love speaker here, but you did, you, you got the, one of the lowest scores out of all of the speakers. And they have like a hundred speakers. So I was like, that's, oh my gosh. It was, it was heavy. I was like, Ooh, shoot, what happened? What had happened was I completely misunderstood the audience. What they wanted was no fluff, tactics, uh, Etc. But what I did was I just, I, I was on the community floor. So I, I thought, oh, it was a newbie beginner. So I thought it'd be more story driven. Um, and it was, it was very beginner. It was heavy story and it absolutely disconnected tactical social media managers that were there wanted, didn't want any of that. It was kind of a waste of their time. And they didn't think I was funny, maybe also because of the value I wasn't delivering. I really learned about A, knowing who your audience is, also learned to take full ownership. Like my fault, I could have done a better job to uh, make sure I, I knew who I was talking to, et cetera. And then I wanted to get better after. the And, and the mistake was that exact talk, because I just r- did a talk I had just done previously, crushed two weeks earlier at a different event. What was the difference? Who is in the audience and the understanding of delivering it to that audience? Mike said, Hey, uh, you want to come back? Can you do better than last time? I said, Mike, I really think I can. I know who I'm talking to now. I know that you just want no fly. I don't need to tell a story. Let me open up my deck. Let me share some screenshots of analytics. I can go as tactical as you want, bro. Let's go deep. Um, but taking full responsibility for my mistake and learning from it, man, knowing who you're talking to, their education level, are you as a beginner, intermediate, advanced? Uh, what's their background? What is maybe some humor, some stories? Spoke in Florida earlier this year um, to a lot more Gen X and baby boomers and inserted last minute a story about my grandfather who served in the Army Air Corps and my grandmother who they met. She was in the uh, Air Corps as well as a mechanic on planes. And I shared this story. I had, I had people coming after me. That was the story that resonated because I thought this room will relate with that. And family and legacy, these were insurance providers and financial men. I was like, this story matters here. I don't know if this story would matter as much if I'm speaking to a Gen Z audience. Those details matter. Really understanding who is it you're talking to, that could be the key to power up your communication. Mm. Did you get a chance to go back and do that talk yet? I did. So I've been, I think I was back at least, maybe this last year was the first year back since the um, pandemic. I did a new talk. I talked about the perfect video recipe, which is one of the chapters in yep. YouTube Secret Second Edition. And, um, and it crushed good scores, great scores. And by the way, and it probably, probably one of the talks that I most over-prepared for <laughs> because of the overcorrection right. of literally the worst scores of my life, like being the last place right. of the worst speaker at this entire <laughs> event. It's sung, man. And especially, uh, I mean, you got to be able to suck it up, but yeah. you know, learn from your failures. But, uh, but it, it hit me hard because I, I, I want to, if the things I'm committed to, I want to do my best. And it always is a bummer to disappoint people or to, to strike out, but Hey, we're all going to strike out. Sometimes you get up, learn from it. Failures are the stepping stones to success. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to say a couple of things and I want to get into some of the, the high level strategies that you write about in the book, YouTube secrets in that you mentioned Kevin Hart. I think Kevin Hart knows who he is I think he knows he's a small guy trying to play in a big person's world, quite literally, that he's also a smart, dumb guy. And he plays that character really well. Like if you use a word he doesn't know, he's like, I know that word. And you just, he makes it up and he's like, he's pretending. But he knows that you know that he's pretending. And I think that's brilliant. I'm not saying that everybody should not evolve or steer away from their core. You could do whatever you want as you progress. But I find that your sense and style of humor is very endearing. It just, it's, I look at it, I'm like, that's Sean. That's just who he is. Just 
go with it. And and when you tell those jokes and and you drop them in there and you say it very seriously, like and I'm like, I know he's joking right now, but the way your delivery, it's it, it's perfect. I, I would just say it's perfect, but that that just could be me. Okay, let's get into the book a little bit. I'm an entrepreneur. You've you've convinced me. I, I know uh, in my heart already before you even spoke that I need to be getting onto YouTube and creating content for all the reasons we talked about. I also have things I, I, I can say. I've written articles. I might have written a book, but I don't have the time, but I do have money. So give me some high level tactics or strategies. If you can afford it, here's what I would do so that you can grow your channel, your authority as quickly as possible. Number one, um, take you behind the scenes to our event, Grow With Video. You were there on the third day. We had kind of a mastermind, deeper dive business day. And one of our speakers was Brad Lee, and he shared the concept of don't create content, be the content. Now, maybe Gary Vee said document, don't create, but I always either misunderstood him or felt like he was saying something different. Like, okay, you're not an expert yet. Share the journey, vlog the journey. And I never actually thought that was a good strategy. I think that there's too many people doing that. It's hard to grow. But if it's, if it's document your life as a business owner or your expertise as a business owner, don't sit down and create, then, then Bradley and Gary would be saying the same thing. Be the content, don't create the content. And the story went like this. Bradley hired a videographer. So we're talking a business owner with money. Hires a videographer. That videographer starts showing up to the office and they would schedule time so they could shoot some content for social media for YouTube. And the videographer would knock on his door. Hey, Brad, we need a film. And he'd you know tap his watch. Brad would say, oh, I'm busy. A, a meeting's going long. Day after day, week after week, this happened for a couple of weeks and he just kept punting it. And he's paying the guy, but he's not actually sitting down to create content. And then finally one day, he was about to go into another meeting virtually or someone sitting in the office. And he's like, you know what? Just come in here and start filming. And what he did, his strategy is as simple as I'm about to describe. I think the key is hiring the right people. Is he just started to have the camera on, mic'd up with a lav mic. And excuse me, he would um, do a meeting. So he's doing a coaching call or he's talking to his team or he's giving an instruction to another team member or he's leading a team meeting. He's delivering some leadership content, some tactical content and that videographer's filming. And then he left it up to that videographer and whoever else, maybe a social media manager, maybe the person filming isn't the strategist, but he turns it completely over his team to then distribute on social media. Brad Lee is not everybody's cup of tea, that's for sure. But if you look him up on Instagram, the real bad Brad Lee the views are are pretty staggering in terms of the real views he's getting. And uh, and then there's also a, his YouTube channel is very influential. So document, be the content, don't create content is the absolute most high leverage thing. It's maybe a courageous move to take the time to hire the talent um, and then to allow them to just, oh, sure, if the meeting's private, then it's not that one. But there's many instances where maybe you're delivering 10 or 15 minutes to your staff or to your team. And then that could just be cut and put on online. And you want to talk about leverage. You don't do anything. Yes, you got to set it up. But once it's set up, you just focus on your day-to-day -day business ops and that person can, can do what they're doing. Secondly, and you, myself, Brad is also doing the same thing um, and many others, is I think the highest leverage activity is starting a video podcast. Because you just kill 36 birds with one stone. And you are, in this case, sitting down to interview somebody or to deliver some kind of a solo round type of content. But not only do you get the YouTube video out of that, you could distribute the audio on the audio platforms, but you also get the clips. And that would include clips for YouTube potentially, but it also could trickle down all the way into social media. So to summarize, if you said, Sean... What would you do right now if you have money, you don't have a lot of time and you want to tap into this? Let me put my, I'm going to put myself um, in the shoes of Anton Stenner. He is a good friend, real estate investor, and my real estate agent up here in Snohomish, uh, Washington. And he's got money. Uh, he's very busy. He's doing deals. He's meeting with clients. He's helping me. He is now pumping out his reels game, but he hasn't started his YouTube channel. If I'm Anton, I'm investing serious cash. I'm going to take a loss 
potentially for a year or two because I have the money. Um, and I am going to step one, wor- work on acquiring talent, hiring. There's a good book called Who Not How. The best person to hire would be a director of even of the other roles. My friend Ryan Pineda puts it like this, hire top down. So wait, okay, I got to hire an editor, but oh, that guy doesn't know how to actually optimize a YouTube video. So I got to hire somebody to optimize the YouTube video, but none of these guys have the skill to graphic design. So who's doing the thumbnail? I got to, no, no, no. How do I do all that? Hire one person and let's get real raw. This might be a 70, 80, 90, 100K role. That would be a mastery level. That'd be the director. Think of it as like the CEO of your media company. The person who is responsible, you find the contract editor, you find the graphic designer, um, you, you, here's the schedule on my time that I'm going to let you put it in there. You're the producer of the podcast. You're scheduling the guests. You're eventually get the admin assistant that is going to schedule the guests, but you're responsible. It's who's waking up thinking about this. That would be, I think the most intelligent way to do that, uh, assuming you have dollars and then tracking all the way back. Cause you might go <laughs> sticker shock a like hundred grand for just the one role. What about the cameras, the other roles? software, all the different things we invest. Well, you know, we, re- Alex and Layla Hermosi, they just keep updating it every single month, but they recently revealed that I think they're spending $125,000 a month on organic content creation, video editors, software, team cameras, whatever wow. it takes. Um, and that is because the ROI is there, the ROI impact to the bottom line, but also the ROI impact to the brand lift, the marketing dollars, all the other things. So, of course, this has to just track back to make sure you've connected in your own mind and with whoever you work with. How does this correlate to ROI? Just do the math. So as a business owner, your responsibility would say, okay, when you hire a six-figure position, you don't pay them six figures up front. You only got to pay that first month. And so you can start investing today to realize I'm investing ahead of time. I was in an event where Ezra Firestone talked about how he thinks about hiring people. And he goes, I actually think about hiring people that they're not going to be a positive ROI for six months. So I'm actually planning on losing money on the individual for at least six months. And I, what's interesting is many people listening to this, probably yourself, you said that's actually been the case where many times the ROI could be almost instant. That is a possibility. It could actually be one month or it could just be, it's, they, they, they do the role, they fill the role. But in this case, you actually are taking a level of a gamble if you're starting from scratch, because you're like, my YouTube channel is not successful yet, whatever. And that's still, that's the move I would make. What I know from Anton landing the plane would be, he's got the dollars. Building his brand is never going to hurt him. He also spoke. I said, what is your ROI? It wasn't that he could get more people that want to buy or sell a home. Um, that is decent, but that's not why he'd want to build his brand. He goes, what's what the real winning play would be is the Grant Cardone strategy and many other real estate gurus would be the raising money strategy that the bigger your brand, the bigger that you're known to quote, quote Grant Cardone, no matter how everybody feels about him. Sounds like Grant to say this. uh, If they don't know you, they can't flow you. (laughs) And so, so (laughs) funny. It sounds like him. And, um, but, but how is he able to, to raise for Cardone capital? Uh, which I know has come under scrutiny, uh, scrutiny recently, but uh, you know whether it was brand informally with deeper pockets or different guys, a lot of people build in syndications. Guys are raising millions of dollars because of building no like and trust on social media, and so that, that that you're probably listening to this, and this is not your business model, but I think that's the key. What am I also working towards? What is it I'm trying to build? I mean. Let me go the polar opposite, Chris. Why even do this at all? I mean, I know I want people to get YouTube secrets and I know I want people to be on YouTube, but but unless we start with first principles and we start with the end in mind and we we are purpose driven, I think it's really important to get super clear on what winning looks like three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. What are you trying to build? Do you want to be known and have a brand? Are you also investing ahead of time? Because when you have attention, when you've grown your email list, when you have subscribers, you, your your next five to 10 to 15 moves, you may not even need to monetize right away. Like Anton, for example, he doesn't need to monetize this year, next year, next year. So he could be playing a long game. Then you hit that tipping point to what you're saying where 
In a year, ad revenue offsets all of or the majority of the cost to produce the content. So that's kind of cool. But what you're really playing for is maybe the fund or the investment or the multifamily thing he wants to build years later. That's how I would do it today is I would staff around it and treat it as a small business, as a new division I open, treat it as a media company I'm starting and hire from the top down and essentially hire a CEO of your media company um, running your YouTube channel and the team that supports it. The theme that I got from all that you said there was integration. That if you're thinking about a social media strategy, whether you want to go on YouTube, TikTok, or Instagram, or wherever else, it's you can't think of content creation and content marketing as a separate thing that you have to do. It's got to be a big part of who you are and what you do. Because those that are able to tap into that will have a competitive advantage compared to those that don't. The question I get asked a lot is, what would you do? What would you tell your younger self? And I would say, get on the content game sooner. Make that a part of who you are and what you do. So it's not a separated activity. So with Brad Lee's example, it wasn't like, I'm going to go create content now. What I'm doing is the content. I just need someone to document that. And because the greatest way that you could demonstrate your expertise is to show people literally you coaching a team, giving advice, doing a sales call, whatever your expertise is. And we see a lot of these kinds of videos, at least on my feed on TikTok. I just like watching blackhead extractions. So what does that person do? They're demonstrating to you what it is that they do. These are so addicted to me. I can't stop watching them. And that's that's really what you need to do. So it's not like you stepping outside of your environment putting on your YouTube face, putting on your radio voice and doing that thing. Just do what you do and be brave enough to bring the world into this little place. And hopefully over time, an audience will show up for you. I also like that tip that you said, you know what, it's, especially if you have money and you've made this commitment, don't try and figure this out yourself. Don't try to be the director, just hire the director and make a commitment. And I also like that, you know, you broke it down. If you're thinking it's a hundred thousand dollars salary, it's divided by twelve, which is divided by thirty. It, it, it could be or three hundred sixty-five. It could just be broken down into little pieces, and you're not spending all that money up front. Smart play. I want to get into something with you right now, which is, like I said at the beginning of the our conversation, I need to catch up to Think Media. The future has to catch up to you. That's just how I have to do it. And you're going to say, no, you're not, because we're going to keep outpacing. You. That's the way it's a game we'll play. So I want to ask you, what have, what has been some of your highest performing videos? Tell us the video, tell us a little bit. Mm. And what is it that you think that made it tick? Cause I would love to be able to make hits all day long. It's not possible. So I want to learn from you. I'd love to trade back and forth and compare notes. Hmm. Well, man, as we, as we dig into this little bit, I think one of the questions is it's really, it can be difficult to define what winning looks like. Yeah. Because is winning look, is winning impressions, is winning, um, views is you could be viewed, uh, have a lot of views or are you getting the right views? And let me tell you the top 10, I'm pulling them up on think media, top 10 most viewed videos of all time on think media. And the first one, let's go in reverse uh, order. Um, we're going to go top eight. The, the eighth most viewed one is 2.5 million views. How to make YouTube videos on your phone. Beginners tutorial. A couple of reasons why that one, uh, everybody has a phone. Broad appeal is a big key into getting maximum amount of views. Now, this is on brand for us because we teach people how to make videos uh, and how to create actual content. But if we were to say how to make YouTube videos on your Fuji X-T4, I, I don't think it's possible to get 2.5 million views because not that many people have that camera. On your phone is a broad appeal. So how wide is the audience? Second key would be beginners. Beginners is also always a larger market than intermediate or advanced. The most people in any anything are always beginners. Um, next, two years ago, how to make a YouTube video for beginners start to finish. This video is two hours and five minutes. I'm a big proponent in extra long form content. Our, uh, our friend Lewis Howes and Evan Carmichael, their top performing videos are two, two and a half, three, and even four hour videos right now. They're doing what these, these super long videos that... The key is they're really rich. In their case, it's rich in maybe an individual or a topic with lots of experts sharing information on a topic, but how to make a YouTube video 
for beginners start to finish is basically like a free deep dive class that delivers on the promise of the title. That'd be another key. You make a promise in a title and YouTube videos, and then you deliver on that promise in the video. It's two and a half hours. This video is not easy to make. This was a, it's an in-depth. I talk about the gear. I sit down and film it. I take them step by step through the editing. I take them step by step through the upload process. It is literally delivering on how to make a YouTube video start to finish as 2.6 million views. Uh, next is 2.6 million. How to come up with the YouTube name, three tips and mistakes to avoid. Again, the how broad the question is, how much interest the question is. This is why keyword research or topic research is still worth doing because there's a million topics you could talk about next on YouTube. If one had 10 people a month interested in it and one had 10 million a month interested in it, which one is giving you a bigger opportunity of reach? The one with the broader interest by a large majority of people. Next, uh, six years ago too, 2.9 million views, the best cheap cameras for YouTube, six budget camera reviews. Cheap and budget are the key there because um, there's more people are on a budget and are looking for a cheap option than are looking for a premium option. Luxury, as I know that you probably have taught a lot, it'd be better to pursue clientele on the high end because it'll be easier to work with. You could work with fewer clients um, and, and you may need to sell less items at a premium price than cheap. But nevertheless, if you think about, again, broad appeal, 2.9 million views, Cheap cameras for YouTube, budget cameras for YouTube. Six years ago, this video, what for these are all not none of these are actually viral videos. Viral maybe by age, but usually what a by definition viral video is something that quickly accumulates a lot of views. I did a video called How to Get Free Stuff on Amazon. And it shot up. And I think why is because quite literally that was true. This was back when there was these websites that would send you free stuff if you'd leave a product review and you would just fill out your information and it could be pretty cool. They'd send you like a little phone charger. And so the appeal of that locally and globally in the U S and around the world was pretty wild. And it delivered on the promise. Like you're at home and you just invest a little time and someone's shipping you free stuff from Amazon. People were pretty pumped and it spread like wildfire. The final three, number three, the bronze, the best video editing software and video editing tips this also, I would admit that today, this might be hard to repeat. This is maybe being first. It's not too late to start YouTube. I still believe it's a blue, blue, blue ocean and saturation is a myth, but I think you got to go more specific. The riches are in the niches. But at the time, this was a seven minute, 35 second video that um, delivered a good answer to the question. But in the thumbnail is a picture of Final Cut and Premiere which there was a lot less options then. That doesn't even say that in the title, but visually someone that's maybe trying to decide between those two would see that and um, delivered very valuable content and answering a question that many people ask, best video and software and video editing tips. And then number two, the silver, best copyright free music for YouTube, top three sites and the text in the thumbnail. I've got headphones on, good, I'm holding up a phone with a little uh, music logo on it. And the text in the thumbnail says free music for YouTube videos, which again, cheap and budget's gonna do good. The word free is historically uh, untouchable in marketing, free gift, free prize, free. So, so free music for YouTube videos. And again, people could argue, well, is this clickbait, right? That, or, or, or that sounds hypey. The key is that you wanna have ethical clickbait. You wanna bait the click but it's honest. Clickbait by definition means it's deceptive typically. So it's like you click and then the video doesn't deliver. That video literally gives you three options for completely free music that you can use in your videos with no copyright claims. And it got 3.8 million views. So being arguably maybe one of the best videos on the platform of just delivering great information and great solutions. Again, the title makes a promise and the video gives an answer. But number one goal, this will be a surprise. And this, I think, is a good example and a joke internally on our team because how is success really measured? And even though this is our most viewed video, I would say it's not even near our best video. And it got 4.6 million views. It was posted a year ago. And it's 30 plus funny sound effects YouTubers use with a meme guy in the photo, funny sounds, and then parentheses royalty free. 
And this video just is stuck to our top of our real time analytics, always getting views. People are searching it probably because a 14 year old video editor is looking for a fart sound, searches this, finds this video. And then in his home movie that he's going to upload on TikTok or YouTube, finds this video and puts it in there. Now, of course, maybe others are finding that as well, but that's probably who the audience is. And therefore it goes back to, yes, while it does have 4.6 million views for someone listening to this, that maybe wanted to get a few high paying consulting gigs a month, that would be the wrong video (laughs) to attract your ideal audience as many views as you get. So what we joke about, because there's that one and another one that stays stuck to the top, which is royalty-free sound effects pack YouTubers use, is I always joke, I go, we're a, we're a sound effects channel. And I go, and sure enough, we are still the number one downloadable sound effects channel, which is not who we want to be. Now, I also have to be thoughtful about my brand. It's not so off brand that we're going to make it unlisted or private, but these are some this key strat- strategic distinctions that you don't want to get into trend surfing, or rather chasing. You don't wanna just chase trends or just pursue as many views as possible as if that's the only metric. What does impact look like? What type of videos would attract the ideal audience? But it's a mix of both. So many leadership principles and truths are held in tension. It's, It's the tension between reach, impressions, brand growth, brand impressions, top line reach, and also impact, depth, and uh, it's not really either or, it's both and, and being a content strategist, being thoughtful of your top video. So those are the top eight and uh, maybe a few distinctions we can learn from them. Mm. Okay. Uh, that last one, your top one, it's, a, it's like a prank video, right? Isn't the title How is Successfully Measured and it's got like funny sound fart effects? Did, or did it's I- just, it's, it's literally just like a, a motion graphics background with an audio wave and it goes like fart <laughs> swoosh and it it says what it is on screen and it just goes through all the sound effects yeah. and that's it and so it is a very search utility practical again someone's in their high school video editing class on the internet looking for funny sound effects YouTubers use and they just download that that video using 4K video downloader, <laughs> throw it in their final cut project and never know who we are right. and never see us and never subscribe. Right. But on the flip side, you know, whatever. So it, it, it is it is a utility that is on brand for Think Media. Yeah. But I mean if I go deeper, let me mention a few things. Actually I don't I think one of these and we may have lost this money somebody copyright claimed maybe one sound. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we uh, could fight that. Maybe they did. It's, it should have earned Mm 13,300. Yeah. This one's no copyright content. So this video has earned us 13 grand. So that's kind of crazy in in its own right. Um, But uh, what I was going to look up was the, the demo on this video, the demographics. And so the audience is uh, 18 to 24 is 46%. I mean, that's, 13 to 17 is only 10%. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. And, and it's led to 12,200 subscribers. I think just the thing to be considerate of, and again, happy to leave this video public. I think it's still on brand enough for us. But you want to be cautious to not attract subscribers. You don't want to attract the wrong subscribers. It's not a race to who can get the most subscribers. It's It's... The goal would be who could get the right subscribers um, and the most maybe engaged audience. I would say we're kind of doing both. Think media has kind of got a mass market approach, but we're also trying to be thoughtful about then how we reach those. And by the way, for as much as I hope what we do, we're just trying to be guinea pigs. We're just trying to be test subjects that can go through successes and a lot of mistakes, pass along that information uh, to others so they can go further, faster, make more intelligent decisions. So it, again, it's one of those things where I'm like monthly. In fact, every single month, YouTube gives you a top 10, the top content in the last 28 days. And our top two videos are always 30 plus funny sound effects for YouTubers and popular meme sound effects for video editing. <laughs> That's the other one. 
<laughs> and so I'm like, so we're a sound effects channel, yeah. apparently. And, uh, you know, no one really cares about any of us, the deep information or Nolan or Omar or Sean, the content creators or anything else. But uh, we are known for being the sound effects channel. Yeah. And if you made sound effects, that would be on brand and it would be the perfect audience that you're looking for. But it's kind of funny that these are the two most viewed things in your top 10. Okay. Yeah. Here's what I wrote down. Broad appeal, utility, know your audience, and have strong hooks that appeal to a lot of people. Mm. Strong. Okay. Now I start to realize our desire to catch up to you might be ill-advised and and not possible because we don't have a lot of content that has broad appeal. And so I'm, I'm like reading your things and your titles. I'm like, Oh my gosh, how do we, how do we even compete with that? So I'm, I got to go back to the drawing board and talk to the team here. What the heck are we going to do? Well, exactly what you're saying The you could have the wrong goal. So by the way, by all means, catch up to us and surpass us. But I think this is a powerful truth. And I'm speaking to myself as we discuss this. And I hope it adds value to the listener. Your clarity on what winning actually looks like is everything. Yeah. You taking the time to get crystal clear on defining your end goal. And maybe the bigger thing to agitate for the listener is that the way you're defining it now could be wrong or incomplete. It maybe doesn't have enough detail. Or maybe if we keep asking, well, why is it you want to achieve that? And why is it you want to achieve that? That we need to make it a little bit more distinct. And I, and, and I would think that as well, your, I actually think you absolutely could surpass us, but, but do you even want to go broader? The opposite could be true. Actually, let's grow slower. <laughs> like, I mean, imagine if that was a goal, like team, actually, I kind of want to slow down our growth mm. because what I would rather do is get the precise, perfect subscribers for the mission that we're on and who we want to help as opposed to just reaching for a top line number that, what does that mean? And by the way, if you really do some deep thought work and deep personal processing, you still may come to the conclusion that absolutely the goal is to grow as big as possible. And and uh, within creative constraints, we do want to keep pushing for bigger numbers. Well, great. But yeah, in, in today's social media world, where mainly vanity metrics, impressions and views are like the main way we measure winning or even ad revenue, because again, I might go, oh, wow, that video made $13,000. That's actually pretty cool. However, it's actually kind of a drop in the bucket compared to our other revenue. So a lot of times, good is the enemy of the great. And we get distracted by these lesser things. There's a good book called The Pumpkin Plan. And it's basically applied to business about how to grow a prize-winning pumpkin is the fact that you have to cut off the little pumpkins. And all the little ones will will suck away, even though you're like, look at all these Great size pumpkins that we have around. We recently, we sunsetted a program this year that was earning about $24,000 a month. That sounds ludicrous. That actually sounds, for a small town kid, college dropout, that thought earning six figures a month was like the pinnacle. As a business owner, I have to work on my mindset to say, okay, well, that's a good thing. It's $24,000 a month. That's incredible. But we, we had to make the hard decision to sunset it because compared to some other things, it was hurting the prize winning pumpkin. It was a little, it wasn't even a little pumpkin. It was a pretty good sized pumpkin, but it's sucking energy resources away. And where the real magic can happen is when you actually simplify down and maybe let go of. So anyways, I mean, I don't know. Should I make the videos unlisted? I don't, I don't know. You could, you could really dig deeper into analytics to see how many return viewers, uh, returning viewers versus, uh, new viewers are related to this video that come to it and, uh, and you keep doing your best. And so, um, there it is. Yeah. So the, the lesson to learn there from some videos that might help your channel grow in terms of subscribers, but it will grow the wrong audience. And ultimately that'll hurt you because as you release new videos that are on brand on channel, that this other audience who came in, like they're not watching it. So it shows a lower percentage of your audience who are shown the video actually watch it and that can hurt you. I, my goal is perpetual growth and I would use anything within my arsenal mental tricks to just push us to keep trying new things and finding more effective ways to teach and, and to grow. So when I think of it, I think it's a Jim Rohn who said it's like the goal is important, but it's not as important as the person you become in the pursuit of the goal. 
Mm. So we know our channel. We know the content. I'm not doing dance videos. I'm not doing whatever it is that I need to do to grow the channel. I want to grow while delivering on that clear message and the value that we've been able to do in the past. Now, we'll share this quickly and uh, I'm going to have to land this plane pretty soon here. But the top three of the five videos that are on our channel are the same video, Sean. Mm. <laughs> so we were like, what? The top most viewed video that we have is 49 million views. It's a short. And number five is the same video, just cropped vertically so that it's more for shorts content. And that has 3.2 million views. Okay, so why why are the top three? Okay, so there's a couple of things you can learn from this. First, we made this longer video, which is, uh, I don't know how long it is. It's, uh, it's 36 minutes. And one segment in there that we cut together is the, that long video squeezed down all the juice into the most bombastic thing. And that was released as a short that, that then got us like 700,000 subscribers from that one video. Now, here's, here's what I put out there. I think I know what the formula is for our channel. And every person's channel is going to be different. When I am doing something that is contrarian or highly polarizing... You could be for it, you could be against it, doesn't matter. When I'm doing something that feels like it's real, I'm some emotion, like this is reality TV. I'm arguing with a potential client and we're going through stuff that you're going to be on one side or the other and it stirs up all kinds of emotions. And then there's a piece of value that's baked into that. That seems to be the winning formula for any video that pops for us. That's a That's a formula though that I do think applies to almost any niche and yeah. any platform. The polarizing one is a big one. Yeah. If it could be triggering, and again, the goal would be, I think, to do that ethically is you're not like sitting down to just make something up. You're digging deep into self-awareness of what is your true values, principles, convictions, um, and then not being afraid to share those. Also, a something that hurts, I think, social media virality is hedging. And... One of the things that helps it is by stating something in an absolute. I think what we have to remember is that even truth is held in tension, that there could be two sides. This is a mistake for me because when I do think about every audience, I like to hedge. That's not what triggers and goes viral. What goes viral is by making a statement. What we're afraid of is people then go, yeah, but what about the other side? And you could say, well, this was a 16 second short. So it's not that I'm saying there's not another side. And this was actually this is a power principle for anybody who made it this long in the podcast. This is worth, I remember, I remember going to Traffic and Conversion Summit opening session. Ryan Dice actually spoke about five elements of creating movements and five elements of, of, uh, you essentially should create a movement, even a cult. And that's a strong word. But if you look at Jim Collins, built to last, good organizations, good teams have cult like elements. All that to say, was uh, one of those things was he said that the greatest movement leaders speak in absolutes. And he mentioned characters like Grant Cardone and Gary Vee. You oftentimes hear Gary Vee say, I remember back in 2011, I went to a live talk and he said, my friends, if you are not using search.twitter.com daily, you will not be in business Five years from now. Okay. There could be no further <laughs> false statement from the truth. Like there's, first of all, probably the, everybody in that room was probably still in business five years from now. None of them went home and used search.twitter.com. Everybody could probably get away from not, never using Twitter search strategically or whatever. But his conviction <laughs> and the point he's trying to make. Now, me also too, as a background in PR communications, I was a director of communication at a church. I always want to like tell every side, like if you're not using search, unless you're this, or maybe it's not true for every industry, it's not true. So all that to just go a little bit deeper on that polarizing thing. I think that if you're listening to this, sometimes you just might be afraid to put something out there or you, if you are like me and you're like, yeah, but yeah, but what about this or what? And by the way, add on top of that council culture, add on top of that, you're putting something on the internet, but how could you possibly speak to every different background um, economic background, you know, cultural background. And you're like, well, in certain contexts, this could be offensive. You got to be willing to push back, 
all the greats are willing to push past that. They're not, they're, they're, and if we're defining greatness by reach, they're not afraid of being misunderstood. They're not afraid of triggering people. They're not afraid. And this is not, the, I think the myth is a lot of us like to be liked and we like to be um, perceived as kind. We don't want, we don't want to offend anybody. And listen, all of these things can coexist at the same time. Like that could all be true about you. But if you want the growth and the reach, you got to put it out there and be okay with somebody saying, yeah, but what about the alternative? You're like, well, there's an entire video podcast. Like this was just the short of it. Like I break down the other side or, or there's more to it or for you to assume or color in, you leave a little mystery. Like you're leaving it. Yeah. But what if you got to be okay with the 10 what ifs and make the statement. And that was one of the attributes was that, that these movement leaders, and you could argue in social media, these viral videos, because it's, it's really getting a lot of reach is it's, it's, it's polarizing. You're stating something. You're making a conviction. There's emotional tension there, arguably triggering. But Chris, knowing you, you're doing this from a place of integrity, your experience, love for the audience. And I'm sure we could look in the comments and see a lot of people that are upset and offended potentially. Uh, as you talk about how much you should pay, a lot of people, I can never charge that month. Why would you tell people, you know, uh, oh, yes. uh, this, all that kind of stuff. And those are your most viewed videos. You're listening to this right now. There is untold growth for your business, your personal brand, your reach on the other side of you giving up the fear of other people's opinions, the need to be liked, the need to please everyone, and the need to avoid offending anyone. You never could anyways, but you got to crank up that tolerance for that. And there's a lot of growth on the other side when you start putting out powerful messaging that you believe in on YouTube and social media. Sean, uh, before we get out of here, I just want to say a couple of things in reaction to what you just said. The criticism of people that, uh, the criticism about social media that people lobby against me and just social media in general is that we're not having these nuanced, thorough analysis conversations. And there's a time and place for that. But what we have to do is we have to stop someone to get them pay attention long enough so they can learn something they can take action on and improve their lives that day. And I find that when I try to phrase something that's so nuanced, it just loses all the bite and the punch. It's like it's been watered down. And so I need to say in a way that someone who needs to hear this today in this moment can hear it. So I said recently, theory is lonely. It loves action. Don't keep them apart. That is not a nuanced statement. I clearly have an opinion and a point of view to this. And that's the post that uh, people are like, well, let's reshare this. Let's, uh, and that's what happens. So, but if you were to sit there and give a di dissertation on that, people would yawn. They're going to move on to the next thing. We're now, whether you like it or not, the attention span has been so reduced. If you can't capture them in that hook, the headline, the thumbnail, they're not going to watch the video. In the first minute of the video, if you can't keep them, they're out. And so you have to learn the art of storytelling and this kind of the Jenga effect, which is I kind of know what's going to happen, but I can't turn away. You're going to keep pulling apart until it looks like it's going to fall apart and then it's done. I think that's brilliant. And I said it a little bit earlier. It was one that that comes out. I try to repeat it was I also said it's irresponsible for you as a business owner to not be on YouTube. Strong word. And that was one I've cultivated. So it stings a little. So again, that's kind of, hey, take it a page from Gary Vee. <laughs> So, so someone might say, well, irresponsible, it's offensive kind of, what are you attacking my character? Right. You know, like I'm being irresponsible. I think I'm a responsible father. I think I'm a responsible business owner. And, and again, sure. There's so many different ways you can survive in business. Yes. You probably will be all right if you don't get on YouTube, but you don't want to leave that up to chance. Just meaning because your lead sources or your awareness could dry up in other places. So it's nice to be diversified, but that's not me defending the statement. The punchline is to let it sting is you're trying to get people to pay attention. Of course, I can back up the statement, but I think one of the things we're both saying, and this is a power, this is even powerful for me because it's always making me think, think about what are my core convictions, but also what are new ways I can package those to stop the scroll and get attention um, in a way that's in total authenticity, and integrity, but also that's not afraid of being triggering. And that actually is even being intentionally a little bit triggering. I mean, if we really go to probably the modern goat, greatest of all time at this, at this moment, very polarizing figure, would probably be Andrew Tate got canceled and just has a particular way about him. 
of just saying things that are sometimes not new ideas, but he's certainly saying them in a, in a new way. He's saying them in, in, in uh, maybe some new energy and saying some things that uh, these are appear to be his deep convictions. I didn't even really know him until he got canceled. Um, but I think it's kind of a good example. And to that end, uh, if we put some handles on this for the listener, you know, one of the things I think we don't take time to do as business owners necessarily is sit down and say, what are like the five to 10 things you're deepest, you're most convicted about? And of course, maybe your actual, what are actually some of your values and ethics and principles? But it also could be YouTube, like facts about YouTube. YouTube is the best social media platform because it's like a fine wine. It gets better with age. It's the only platform your con- where your content lives forever. It's irresponsible for you as a business owner to not be on YouTube and craft some of those, those A, core beliefs, but then how can you power up some of those? Then those can become some of your core pillar messages. What do you believe to be true about the world? Um, what do you believe to be true about your business in the world? What fires you up and gets you mad, sad, angry? What, what are you, what are you deeply passionate about in relation to what's happening? And I also think, I know some people say, Hey, you're a business channel. Don't talk about politics. You're a, you know, on our podcast, the Think Media podcast, we recently had Patrick Bet David and he kind of shook me a little bit because he said, he said, you actually need to start sharing where you stand on issues because if you don't, people won't trust you. And actually more, whether whichever side you stand on, you're maybe maybe the most extreme people you'll push away. But some people will be like, okay, I know where he stands. I follow him for YouTube. I don't agree with him on that fact, but uh, I'm at least he's, he's being open. And his point was a compare and contrast between Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Elon being very public, very outspoken, very polarizing, but just blowing it all up. Some would say maybe negatively, but positively in terms of his personal brand, business, et cetera. We'll see how it all plays out. And Jeff being a lot more hidden and, and him saying Elon is, is essentially kind of doing it right. And people could be very mad at him, but he's outspoken and he's, he's sharing beliefs. This is maybe the key. What are you willing to take a stand for? What is the standard? And, and vanilla doesn't work in 2023 on social media. Like pick a side. Pick a fight, but don't just pick a fight for picking a fight a fight's sake. That's being a jerk. That's being rude. What is the fight you actually care about? And, and then what would you be afraid? Make a list. What would you actually, what do you deeply believe? What would actually be afraid to say on social media? What do you deeply believe about your industry, about your competitors? Who's your enemy? And Chris, you know this in good marketing and branding, the best businesses have a good enemy. And the enemy could be, greedy course sellers who put out horrible information and give give course creators a bad name greedy internet marketers that that all they care about is image and ferraris and so i go that's that's one of my enemies is 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 the lifestyle of it's all about money and wealth and i'm like it's all about family and impact i'm going to take a stand whatever and so these are some handles where i think you take some of this material and you put this into your future youtube videos vertical videos, podcasts, uh, you're going to take those things to a whole nother level and reach a whole nother level of impact and then be ready for the backlash because you have crucified the fear of other people's opinions, a fear of man, a fear of, of backlash because they didn't even know you anyways. Now they do know you. And so you're getting the negative comments, but what about the people you're called to reach? And for every person that you polarize, there's somebody else that now has discovered you and you're able to impact them with your product services, your mission and your message. Sean, what a way to end it. That was straight fire. Uh, In case you're just tuning in right now, I've been talking to Sean Cannell who co-wrote the book with Benji Travis, YouTube Secrets. They have an updated version all for 2022 and 23. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And if you, dear audience member, have made it all the way to the end of this, however long this is going to wind up being edited to, reward yourself by subscribing to this channel to leave a comment and to leave a review and sean if people want to find out more about you and think media and the book where should we send them yeah chris thank you again for having me on and so much love and respect for your audience you're such a person of integrity vision excellence and i know that people who follow you follow you for those reasons so massive love and respect to your community the book's on amazon so physically on amazon ebook on amazon and then audible for the audiobook brand new audiobook recording Benji and I did in the studio. And so if that's the way you love to consume uh, books, definitely check that out. 
The second edition, three new chapters, deleted chapter, all rewritten, 90 new pages, brand new appendix with all kinds of free resources and training and videos. Um, I think it's a good investment of $4.99 for the ebook if you're interested in doing YouTube and happy to uh, help and answer anybody's questions. I'm Sean Cannell, rhymes with YouTube channel on social media accounts. Hit me up, reach out, tweet me, DM me, uh, here to help and uh, really believe that um, YouTube could be a key vehicle to helping you reach your goals in the future.